Hi everybody, my name is Alex Dergachev and this is my colleague Rukmini Halibal. Hello. We, we are here to give you a talk about estimation. Uh, as, we, as we just uh, went around the room, about half the people here are working in an agency of some kind and half the people are actually internal on a project team and trying to figure out how to uh, better plan their next project. And so we'd like to have an interactive conversation a little bit uh, about, about project estimation and, uh, and just some ideas and lessons learned that, that we have. Yeah, so welcome to the how and why of project estimation. As Alex just introduced me, uh, my name is Rukmini Hallowell. I am a senior project manager with Evolving Web. I'm from the Great White North in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, if any of you guys have been, I'm sure. I have seven years of industry experience, kind of scattered through advertising, marketing, web, and events, so a lot of different types of projects that I've managed as well. And uh, I truly believe in building client relationships. I think building a friendship is super important with your clients and helping that progress through your projects. Awesome. Uh, my name is Alex Dergachev. I'm the co-founder of Evolving Web. The company turns 15 years old uh, in a few months. And uh, we've been doing Drupal for 14 of those years. Uh, at the, I've played many roles and wore many hats at the company, uh, starting from our first Drupal backend developer, first sysadmin, uh, first conference booth, uh, assembler, and uh, of course, when we started getting bigger and bigger projects, uh, estimation was, uh, and, and the commercial side of things was, was my responsibility up until about a couple of years back when the team, the commercial team got bigger, and, and now I just uh, provide my historical insights. So if any of you guys are familiar, we are Evolving Web. We are a full stack web and training agency, and we build our projects from the ground up. Uh, we have over 50 developers, designers, strategists, and project managers scattered across the globe, which is not a hyperbole. We very literally have someone on almost every single continent, with the exception of Antarctica and Australia, but soon, I'm sure. <laughs> um, we have over 13 years of Drupal experience, which has led us to be leaders in this space. We work with organizations, both big and small, to help them be the change makers that they want to be in the world. Speaking of which, here's a little cross-section of some of our clients that we work with. Great. Uh as you, as you guys will see, we do a lot of higher ed. Uh, we've done a number of projects for Princeton. Uh, we are, of course, Princeton University Press was the first one, and uh, <laughs> one that we're still very proud of. Uh, we have uh, been doing more and more government stuff, which is uh, both at the, at the Canadian, uh, provincial, and federal, and also uh, the, the US, U.S. Senate was one of our first U.S. federal uh, projects that we did in the last few years. Uh, we are very excited about Drupal. We've been we've been basically dedicated as Drupal specialists from the second year of our founding since uh, since I went to DrupalCon Seged and, and I fell in love with the community and uh, with the open source ethos of of, uh, of both the software and the people behind it. And uh, so we are very very much attached to the space. My my wife and co-founder Suzanne is the if the is the head of the Promote Drupal initiative and she was on the Drupal Association board and. Uh, of course, as the company has grown over the years, uh, we, we actually are over 70 or even maybe 80 people. Uh, we are uh, beginning to, to do other technologies as well. Customers often ask for React or something decoupled projects or uh, even mobile development, uh, usually with a Drupal backend. Uh, and and even, even uh, we're going back to our very initial roots and doing some more WordPress, WordPress work as well because a lot of organizations want both Drupal and WordPress. So, if you guys ever find yourself in Montreal, Quebec, these are some of the smiling faces that are going to greet you in our office. This is just some of our team photos. Yeah, we, uh, we, we help organize uh, the, the Drupal North, which is the, the, the regional uh, camp and conference in for, for Canada East. Uh, and of course, uh, for pre-COVID days, we've, we've, been, we've been hosting or helping organize or sponsoring or presenting at, at Drupal Camp Montreal. And uh, for a couple of years, uh, before COVID, we also did a, a monthly UX Montreal meetup at our office, so where we where we do a show and tell of a project. Somebody presents what they're working on for five ten minutes, and then the, the group decides to give feedback. So that's that's a big part of our identity and uh, something that we're really excited to restart. So for today's presentation, I'm going to introduce you to one of our very high profile clients. Um, we'll be kind of referring back to them here and there throughout the presentation. So I thought I'd give you guys a little bit of an intro. Ducky's Dog Salon. <laughs> Now, Ducky's Dog Salon is a bustling mid-sized corporate company. Uh, they're looking for a new website. They want a nice, fresh look, new redesign. 
They have a big events calendar that they want to highlight. They are looking for an online booking component. Right now it's call only, which is not great. Uh, they want a new and improved site map, and of course it's 2022, we don't believe in discrimination. They are looking for some cat-specific service listing pages. Um, and like I said before, I really believe in getting to know our clients on a personal level. So I'll tell you a little bit about our client. She likes long walks on the beach and some belly rubs. And if you have not guessed, our client is my dog, Duck. This is what Ducky's webpage currently looks like. Um, you know, not great. She doesn't have thumbs, so can't really expect that much from her. But we are looking forward to bringing it into the 21st century. Now, Ducky also does not deal with any kind of monetary income. She is a dog, that would be certain. So uh, she pays us in dog treats. So I just want to get a little bit of audience interaction today. How many dog treats do you think is in this bag? Like, give it a little shake for you guys by a show of hands. How many of you guys think that there is maybe 10? 23? 31. Pardon? There's a picture of what you're holding. What I'm holding. Okay, 31 and 40. Okay, so I didn't exactly set you guys up for success here. It's kind of hard to gauge from as far away that you are, but perhaps if I had passed this around, some of you might have opened up the package and individually counted them. Maybe some of you would have noticed that there's 100 grams on this bag, and if you did some simple math, maybe two and a half grams per treat multiplied by that or divided by that, and you would have gotten a number, or some of you would have been like, hey, Rob, I have a dog. I bought these exact same treats before. I know exactly how many are in there and it's 41. So keep that in the back of your mind. We're gonna come back to this principle a little bit later on in the presentation today. Do we know how many there are really? 41. Uh -huh. mm. <laughs> and that is a synthesis of all the ones I just talked about. But before we get into that, let's go over the process of what estimation really looks like. So when a client comes to you and they're asking for an estimation, there's some things that you need to ask yourself. First and foremost, are they asking for a ballpark or a range? Or are they asking for a firm and final estimation, calculation, sorry. They're often looking for a commitment. So make sure you're setting your expectations with your client. Are you discussing an estimation or a range or are you discussing a firm and final number? Make sure that you're both on the same page. It'll save you guys a lot of grief on both sides. Going into uh, sucky, not to be confused with sexy, even though project management is very fun, I can't imagine it's that fun for most of you. So that just stands for scope, estimate, commitment, and execution. Each of these various phases will be handled by a different department or a different person in the ball game here. So scope and estimation. The scope is set by the client. That's what they're looking for for their desired goal and the time frame that they're looking to get it done in. Ducky's looking to get a new website with a couple extraneous components, and she's looking to do that in six weeks. So those extraneous asks are important too because it's part of the larger goal, and it'll help you build that idea. Um, these are not always necessarily attainable. I'm sure many of you here have worked with various clients, and they're looking for the world on a shoestring budget. So it's always important to make sure that this is an ongoing conversation and a discussion that's happening. Next is the estimate. This is usually where the project manager goes around, shopping around to the various departments internally, and getting a prediction of how much work and how much time is involved. The commitment. This is done through the project manager. This is a promise inclusive of risk mitigation. So we're gonna to get to risk mitigation a little bit later on in this presentation. It doesn't always need to be the same as the estimate. Like I said, sometimes they ask for a lot, but they don't necessarily have enough to create it. So this will be your final commitment. And then finally, the execution. This is a synchronous dance between all of the team members that results in an on-time and on-budget delivery. It's in an ideal world. So the techniques involved. There are two main principles to project estimation, and that is the top-down approach or the bottom-up approach. The top-down approach is overall project estimated first, and the individual tasks are allocated a certain portion of that total versus the bottom-up approach, which much like bricks that would add to it, each individual task is added to create a grand total. Now with the top-down approach, it is usually occurring with a fixed budget. I have X amount, how much can I do? Versus the bottom-up, which is kind of adding to it. The bottom-up approach is much better for a larger multifaceted projects, and it's also far more accurate um, in terms of being able to, to give you a final number versus top-down, which is a bit better suited for some smaller scale projects. 
which I keep dog slum. That's the difference between I have $25, how many cookies can I buy? Versus the bottom up, which is I want 25 cookies, how much money do I need? Count, compute, and judge. So you can always count where possible and if available. You can compute or do that simple math when you can't count. You or use judgment alone only as a last resort. Now, using historical data and combining this with the other two will be the best approach here because you're using all of these various components. With Ducky's Dog Salon, we actually already did that earlier today, earlier a couple minutes ago. <laughs> uh, opening the bag to physically count them, using that computation to add up the numbers and divide it, or by purchasing this exact block a bit, so you've already used your expert knowledge on the matter. So here at Evolving Web, this is a sample of how we try to compute. We take our tasks, we usually organize it by project phase, break that down further by individual tasks, assign it a low amount of hours and a high amount of hours, so a range of hours. Then we do a simple calculation and average it out, multiply it by the rate, Again, we're working in cookies, and that will spit out a cost. So going into the cone of uncertainty. Um, project management, and specifically with estimation, is not always an exact science, of course, but the more information you have, the better it is. Usually at the start of a project, when you're scoping things out, you have the least amount of information. But as you continue down, things get a little bit clearer. So trying to break down the project into separate phases will really help narrow that down. And it's important that we don't make promises when there's the potential for high risk. So it would help to scope the parts that you know very well and leave those uncertain parts for a little bit later on. And always manage your expectations with client and your internal team. It's really important that everyone is on the same page here. So with Ducky's Dogs Lawn, we there was a little bit of unclarity, um, or lack of clarity. There were some specific needs early on. She mentioned some components. We needed to kind of get into that a little bit better. So what we did is we held some discovery sessions with our key kitty stakeholders. Cat specific pitch, you need all your stakeholders involved. We had to get an idea of their KPIs, what they were looking for, and what constitutes success in their eyes. And again, goal identification, what we like to use is some client surveys, really get to the bottom of what they are looking to accomplish. So when you are going through your estimation process and before you go to your client, you want to have a checklist mentally. So these are some questions that you can ask yourself. Does your estimate break down into project phases? And if it doesn't, do you know how you're going to do that? Do you know who's going to do the work? you got to make sure that you are allocating your resources appropriately. This will prevent future risk. Does your scope include non-programmable tasks? And is the estimate based on previous estimates or a rate card if it needs to be very specific? Is the estimate given as a ballpark or as a firm commitment? Um, and does the, does the estimate account for risk management? And of course, was the estimate accepted without negotiation? Where there's negotiation, there can be a little bit of fluctuation in terms of scope matching up with the actual dollar amount at the end of the day. Going into value-based pricing. Thank you. So I would... Uh... Actually, was that? Yeah. So one, uh, one thing that we've been discussing so far has been estimation techniques and, and what to count or, or like how we can count things. Uh, but it's important to have a, a broader perspective uh, because very often, uh, going back to that first slide that Rook had, very often we are doing project planning as well as uh, project estimation and we're, we're making a decision as to what we're building and with what size team and when you study economics like I did my undergrad you kind of learn that uh, there's there's supply and then there's demand that the intersection of demand is, is is the price and and so sometimes an estimate is an estimate how long will it take but sometimes a, an estimate is a price and, a, and an agreement with, between different people and this could be like, like in our world agency and client but it could be very well be inside of one department or another, or a team member and their boss. And ultimately, any project that gets done, whether you have two separate entities or we're all within a single entity, 
is there's a reason it's being done and there's a value associated to that project. And it's very important not to focus on just the cost or the, the time things take uh, and, and also to realize why is this project being done, what is the benefit from it, and what are the other costs associated with the project that have nothing to do with what's being estimated? What is the opportunity cost involved in not doing this project and doing something else, or having this project not be done and what, what, what won't happen? So you need to have a holistic perspective uh, when, when you're doing this. Um, so we, we, some of these points are about perceived value, but I think ultimately the, the, main, the main takeaway should really be uh, don't just focus on what the work you're going to do, but figure out why you're doing it. And then second of all, uh, people often use cars as an, as an analogy to, to say you can have something that does the exact same thing but cost very different things. I actually don't think that's a great analogy for our world, and I would say buildings is a, is a better one. So I think a website and its different functions is similar to a building. There's, there's a, a hut, a dog shack perhaps, uh, but at the one extreme, there's a residential house there is a, um, a store, there's a warehouse, and then there's an office building, uh, and then there's like, I don't know, the Pentagon, to, to, to put it at the, at the extreme end. And uh, ultimately, when you, when you make a, a Drupal website, I mean, the questions that we ask before we even start asking what features are included, we start asking, well, how many people are going to be using this site? We'll ask, how much content will go into this site? How many pages are there? Then we'll ask, how many content types are there? How many uh, different vocabularies are there? How many uh, paragraphs or paragraph types will there be? Um, we can ask other things that are less, which features do you want and how long will it take, but more, how many modules do we think we're going to have contrib site to, like to, to configure? How many modules, custom ones, are we going to write? Uh, at some point, we're going to start listing the modules, and, and then we'll say, is this a small, a medium, or a large? And, we, and we'll have a, a, a formula of how many dog bones there are or dog treats there are for each one. And, and then we'll be, we'll be doing some combination of counting, like listing, and then estimating or guesstimating. Um, so ultimately, we, we gather the data. Another important uh, input as well would be how many users will be using the site. Uh, not just visitors, but actually like content editors to populate it. Because if you have one superman or superwoman content admin that, that basically takes over site maintenance and, and modifies every page and creates new content and fixes all the bugs, that's, that's one extreme end. And then the other extreme end is some government project where you literally have 70 or 80 or 90 people who are content uh, managers separately from editors separately uh, from the developers, separately from the management team overseeing all of this. And, and then you'll have a car, like a content government, uh, governance uh, needs. You'll have uh, permissions and, and workflows. And, and basically the amount of uh, effort that's expected to be invested in a, in a, in a website that has a 50-person team on the content editing side and millions of people accessing tens of thousands of pages is at the extreme end of, uh, you know, I have a dog salon and I need to get a contact form going. And uh, it's not about features. The crazy thing is both of these sites might have exactly the same number of landing pages and paragraph types, uh, but it's really all about what the expectations are. The, this, this also relates to what the client's expectations are. For example, the, the client that only has a one-person content management team will say, we'll just figure it out. I'm very budget conscious. Let's get me the maximum bang for the buck. Uh, the client that says, I have a whole team that's, that's going to be blocked if you don't have this feature because they, they won't know what to do, that's, that's a different end. And so it's very important that any framework, framework that you guys have in terms of what you're counting and what you're measuring, it's not just you know, what are we building and how long is it going to take to do each feature? Because focusing on that really misses the forest for the trees. So going into project risk assessment, I've talked about risk a lot, so let's get into what that actually means. Um, I don't know if you guys know this about me, I'm a big philosophy buff. Um, so there was a great philosopher of our generation, I believe he said, mo money, mo problems. Uh, but in project <laughs> management, it's actually quite the other way around. Uh, the more problems you have, usually equates to more money. 
So risk can come in a lot of different forms, and they usually end up in the biggest risk of all, which is financial risk. So let's kind of chat through a little bit of some of the risks that you can experience. Timing risk. Your project is delayed. It's a pretty obvious one. A developmental risk. Your tasks have some unexpected complications associated with them. You might need to add more resources, which could you know, lead to more risk. A scoping risk. Your to-do list is starting to grow. Uh, scope creep is a pretty massive risk. Resource management risk. This is where it's really important to allocate your resourcing time appropriately and forecast your projects because unplanned team changes, an upcoming vacation perhaps that no one expected, can lead to more risk. And then of course we have unexpected risks. I don't know, say there's a global pandemic that takes the entire workforce by storm, changing how all of us do work for almost two and a half years. Unplanned surprises lead to risk. Ducky's Dog Salon also had some risks. There was some timing risks. Um, there's too many stakeholders involved, uh, especially around the cat pages. So our solution was that we flagged this quickly and we established a single point of contact. Too many cooks in the kitchen can lead to a lot of risk if you're not careful. Then we had some resource management risk. I don't know if you guys know, but dogs can really tell who's a good person and who's not. Ducky had uh, some preferences with our team. Um, our solution was week weekly resource management meetings um, and where we flagged this issue repeatedly with our, with our team and accommodated wherever possible to have the team that Ducky really wanted working on her presentation, or sorry, on her website. <laughs> this is a presentation. So this goes into contingency. Contingency is essentially a fail-safe to address any unforeseen risks. You can kind of consider this your project insurance plan. Um, it's basically like another tool in your toolbox that helps create a successful project. As with any insurance plan, um, we don't always intend on using it, but it should be there and it should be pre-approved prior to the start of your project. About, say, a little under 50% of the time, we do dip into contingency, so it's really important to have that upfront and approved. Uh, a good rule of thumb is about 20% of your, uh, your budgeted total should be going to a contingency, or should be pre-approved for a contingency. Um, and of course, providing accurate estimations can always reduce the chances of you using uh, your contingency. But the contingency is there for us to use. I would, uh, I would pause here and say, like, like Rook mentioned, contingency is one important tool in, in the toolbox. You know, you, uh, you had a project plan, uh, something doesn't fit in the scope. Well, we had a budget set aside for, for us to deal with it, so everyone's happy enough uh, with, with this change. But there's many others, and um, in fact, um, the, what I've learned over the, the 15 years that I've been overseeing project teams is, is that an estimation is a little bit like a business plan where you write your best idea of, of what you want, but you know it's going to be deviated from on day one. You know that uh, you only had, well, going back to that cone of uncertainty, you only had 10 to 20 percent of the information at the beginning of the project. That you, uh, that you will by the end of it. And some of the 90% that's missing is details, and some of the 90% that's missing is the essence of what you're doing, and it turns out the project is completely different than, than what you thought it was all about. But that's okay, because you, you made a, a clear communication, like a business plan, it's a clear communication of, of what the plan is, what are the resources that are gonna be assigned to it, and then everyone kind of knows if, if there's a, two groups involved, like a client and a vendor, or to a boss and, and a team, uh, you know, everyone knows what are the constraints that you're under, and everyone has a shared conception. And then going forward, you have to work to continuously optimize uh, what, what's happening in order to hit as much of the value that I've already discussed about for why this project is being done versus uh, you know, to optimize the constraints or the costs, which is usually people's times or calendar time or some, some or, or uh, other aspects. Um, going uh, on, the, on the theme of, of, of this, this is obviously sounds a lot like agile web development philosophy and practices. Uh, you, should, you should always be doing the most high value items first. I mean, the low, the low hanging of fruit, if that's a not impolite impression, uh, expression, uh, but the... Uh, the highest value, simplest to, to execute things at the beginning that everyone has consensus about. And then as, as uncertainty gets resolved, then you sort of bring back on the table either the more difficult things or the more poorly defined things or the things that you, 
you kind of hope will drop, drop by the wayside because they're not essential. And, uh, and then you actually just want to get a great, great project in there. So, so that's, that's another uh, way of, of, of doing about it. And it's very much aligned with the agile uh, approach. And, and basically, uh, while there was very likely to be a very detailed scope document with a list of all the deliverables at the beginning, I mean, again, that's still the plan based on not known information from the beginning. Many projects, uh, that's very relevant and meaningful. Many projects, it's not that relevant, depending on how new what you're building is. And as, as managers, all of us, and or as stakeholders even, it's our job to continuously prioritize what is the most important thing to be worked on with the, the constraints and the resources that we have, uh, and so that we can reduce the uncertainty uh, oftentimes, estimates get done on time only because there's continuous negotiation on scope. You know the, the old cliche of you can have it done uh, good, fast, and cheap, right? So if, I think that was Ford, pick two? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's that was, right. That was, uh, so if you think about it, that's a continuous negotiation where you're kind of saying, like, where do I do trade-offs at every given point so that I still come in with the a, with a constraints that we managed? And at times, you have to renegotiate the constraints, where, which is where this contingency kind of helps. Um, all of this makes sense in iteration, and, uh, and so you're not going to get it right in the first or the, even the third time you do it. So refining the project process. The first thing you can do is proactively manage risk. So by monitoring your project budget, tracking week over week expenditures. This really helps when you break it down by phase. Um, that way you can take a look at how much you budgeted versus how much time was actually being spent. So compare and uh, contrast while tracking that. Um, spreadsheets are usually the way to go on that, and you can adjust accordingly. As you know, if you're eating up X percentage of your budget and you're still in phase one, you know how to adjust that as you go until you hit phase four or delivery. Resource management. I harp on that quite a bit, um, and that's because you have to ensure that your shared resources, their time is being allocated properly. There's other projects that come down the pipe. There's unexpected changes. Sometimes project deliverables get delayed. All of this uh, needs to be accurately tracked week over week. Um, and finally, project management or proper project management and proper estimation will ideally prevent financial risks. So at Evolving Web, we use something that looks a little bit like this. Um, this is my weekly resource management tracking sheet. So I break down everything according to the phase and by the person. So we have our budgeted amount that we promised to client, what we projected it to be, what our uh, resource allocation hours were planned for, and what the actual hours being spent are. And week over week, you can track that, and you can kind of get a sense of how your project is progressing, what phase you're in, and what percentage of the budget you've already spent. Uh, so I think this is another great place to pause a little bit and reflect. Um, we introduced this concept at the beginning of the presentation of top-down versus bottom-up, where bottom-up is you're counting all the features that you're doing, and top-down is like, overall, does this feel like a small, medium, large, what's my, uh, you know, and, and, then, and then you work from both sides in order to build a consensus and in order to calibrate the other side. Uh, because, you know, bottom-up may very well come up with a million dollars, and maybe if a budget or a million hours, and, and you don't have that because you have a team of three people. And... <clears throat> So top down, of course, is very, is very uh, loosey goosey and maybe you're just thinking about it the wrong way and, and it requires tremendous intuition and historical knowledge. But together, the two push each other like yin and yang and, and then you, you, you come up with a settlement. And this, uh, this, what you see here, I would say is, is a more of a top, top down approach because you're, you're planning out your, you already come up with a one, one grand budget in your head because you felt it was a thousand hour project, for example. And you're saying, okay, well, out of this thousand hours, how much am I going to give to the, the design process? How much am I going to give to the discovery process? How much am I going to give to the, the, the PM team, the QA team, and the development team, the content strategy team, and, and, the, and, and the webmaster team who populates it, both internally like across, across different organizations? So you, you allocate the pie. You hope you didn't miss anything. You hope that the ratios look good and are appropriate for the project that you're doing. These ratios for each of these categories that some of them who we've listed in the screenshot, uh, we find it tends to be fairly consistent for our kind of projects with the caveat that uh, we have a few different kinds of projects. Some are strategy only. Some are, some are strategy and design and dev. 
Some are dev only or some are, are just migration. Uh, so we have to be mindful of the fact that we have different types of projects that we tend to do. But within those types, uh, the ratios are consistent. We always have this rule of thumb that like, you know, take 20% of development hours and you, uh, for project management. Take maybe another 20% of development hours for, for QA like as, as an add-on. Um, similarly, the, the, you know, on, on, from, from the books that I've read, and it's historically not that inaccurate, uh, in the end, you're going to spend about 20 to 30 percent in discovery over, of the overall budget, and you're going to spend 20 to 30 percent in QA and deployment from the overall budget. So these already should give you a, a sense of how much dev is too much or how much design is too much, and when you say this is, this is really going to go way over any constraints that we've identified at the beginning. Um, then we break this down further, not just in buckets per category, but then we break it down with the exact people that we're going to be working on. This is a very high-level summary that we were comfortable sharing with you here, but in reality, we'll often have one where that includes people's vacations and days off. And, uh, and then we actually see, well, we've allocated 1,500 hours for uh, development budget. Do we even have the development staff available within the calendar months set aside from this project to work on it? If not, let's lower it or raise it. And you... you you might be surprised by how drastically our estimates shift once we do that exercise. Um, so, so it's very important to do this multi-phase analysis where you do your bottom-up approach, then you translate it to this more top-down approach, and then you validate if the top-down approach uh, still works out with the schedule and, and resource constraints that you're under. Uh, and then you adjust sometimes by 50, 60, or 70 percent one way or the other in terms of how big is this actually this project is compared to what you thought you could do. Uh, and finally, post-project retrospectives. These are super important. Uh, these are um, basically assignments that you do at the end of your project to evaluate how things went. So these are some questions you can ask yourself as you go through those uh, retrospectives. They're also sometimes called postmortems if you're more familiar with that term. So things like, what was your project's final logged hours? Um, what was the initial scope and versus what was the scope at the end? Was there scope creep? Um, what was, was there a contingency used and was it enough? Uh, was there a client or internal spin? Do you know why? And um, if so, how did you deal with it? Uh, was there resource switching or context switching? Was this done because resources weren't necessarily allocated correctly? Was there risk or was risk flagged in a timely amount, uh, manner? This is where having weekly, bi-weekly, or even monthly risk management meetings will really come in handy. And of course, what were the pain points? And don't forget what went well. Good project estimation makes for happy clients. Uh, happy clients are always return clients, so it's really important that we get estimation done right. Um, and successful projects are definitely not left up to chance. Uh, there are a lot of steps involved, as we just went through, and a lot of di different tactics that we can implement. Uh, On-budget projects often make for happier employees, too. It's important that our teams are happy and are motivated to work well. Um, and proper estimation reduces stress, certainly for the project manager. I, th I would add that, ultimately, um, it, takes, it takes all the parties involved uh, to work together to come up with the best initial estimate, with the best information available at the beginning. But also remember that that's just a an exercise that reflects what was known and hopefully it's being done in good faith uh, by, by everybody and uh, that everyone is trying to be as transparent as possible about what they need done and what their success criteria is. It helps to be clear about what the value that you're building with, with this project and why. And based on this and the shared success criteria, you come up with a, a, a project plan that everybody believes in and that makes sense for the, for the resources that you have. and and the constraints that you're under. And then everybody will continuously work together to check off all the checkboxes, do all the work, monitor this work, track the time that's being spent, uh, and, and categorize it across the different categories that were initially allocated, and then make continuous adjustments to scope, to resourcing, and, uh, and of course, to expectations in order to, um, to arrive you know, at the end of the scheduled project to arrive where it should be 
and if necessary, uh, to, to make adjustments to the plan too, because as, as more information gets known, as the team gets to know each other, as things get calibrated, uh, you are going to learn a lot along the way. I think the most successful projects are the ones that are part of a relationship. And it's a relationship that's not even like at the very beginning, but it's, it's built over time. Because teams and collaborators and clients and, and vendors need to get to know each other and trust each other and understand what, what these numbers mean. And then work diligently together towards making them happy, happen and then making everybody satisfied with the result. Um, so at this point, I will open it up for any questions or comments. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about your discovery process? How much time do you do in discovery prior to providing your estimations versus discovery after and refining your guesses? <clears throat> That's, that's really great. Uh, thank you for asking the question. The question was, what is, what is the discovery process like? Uh, I can only answer it specifically from, from the perspective of an agency because there's a lot of different people here and they have different uh, constraints that they're under in different worlds. Uh, so from, from Evolving Web's perspective, we have different kinds of clients. Uh, some of them are government clients who, who issue a public RFP that's a 50-page PDF and we're expected to send a 100-page PDF describing exactly what we're going to do and exactly how much it's going to cost. And at that point, uh, it goes back to, uh, you know, what do we know about this thing? We do the top-down and bottom-up approach internally. Uh, there's usually a one-hour uh, call for questions in this formal RFP process. And, of course, you're allowed to send between three and, you know, ten, depending on uh, questions that you or and other competitors will do. So the, the amount of information you get is quite limited formally. Informally, uh, we have the benefit of having worked on similar projects for, for a better part of two decades now, well, like a decade and a half, and so we kind of know the unstated requirements, the unstated risks, the unstated expectations. We know if this is a dog shack or an office building, and you know, we, we don't even need to ask. We, will, we actually will look at the annual report. If it's a nonprofit organization, for example, they always publish their annual report, and I can see the size of their team and, and their overall budget, and so we'll, we might cut down what we thought we were going to quote by a factor of four when we see that, uh, simply because we have to calibrate it to their needs and expectations and constraints. Um, we realistically, I think, on a given project that we do even in this, in this formula, which is the extreme end of limited information, very structured, very formal, uh, we're going to have members of our sales team put in you know, a couple of people, 5 to 15 hours each, just analyzing things. Uh, we, if there's an existing website, we use a tool called Screaming Frog. Uh, in order to crawl it to give us those statistics of like how many content types. Uh, obviously, you don't have access to the Drupal backend, but you can get, uh, guess based on the page structure what are the different content types, the URL structure of each of each page. Um, so we we will look over and, and catalog all the features that we see or listed in the RFP or not. Uh, we will. Um, go through our historical features list. So we have a really big estimation spreadsheet with hundreds of common Drupal-related features, whether it's advanced search, and then we ask, does it index PDFs? You know, are any of the PDFs really big? Uh, is there any, any security uh, audits that you need to do? Is there a performance audit that's expected to be done? Is accessibility a specific requirement, and if so, at what level? Uh, is there content migrations that need to be done? Very often, these things are assumed one way or the other uh, and not spelled out in the brief. But from our experience and having done you know, similar kind of projects for, for so long, we have a big list of common things that end up being very, very material to the estimation. Um, so, so then we go through this estimation process and we come up with uh, lists of assumptions and we try to include both the, what we included and also what we didn't include to make it clear, hey, you probably need this, but we didn't quote it for some reason. Um, on the other end, sometimes we have clients who are very collaborative and they'll come to us and they'll say, here's what we need, what do you guys think? And if you can get away with it, we'll say, well, I'd rather not sell you the whole giant project, but instead sell you a discovery mandate. And it could be a couple of hundred hours. It's kind of meaningfully, it starts there. Um, then we'll go through and we look at their existing site, we'll interview their stakeholders, we'll often have our designers involved and the UX designers because they're the ones who are good at asking the right questions, maybe some strategy. Uh, my, my, my wife and co-founder Suzanne is really great at this at this phase. 
Uh, and so then we'll have a better understanding of what, what it is they're trying to build. And then we will learn with them. Uh, and after a couple of hundred hours, I think you get a lot further in that cone of uncertainty and you, you're able to identify um, pretty solidly what you're looking to build and what's in scope or not. And in that case, uh, the scope is a lot more uh, calibrated towards what we actually have. So less guessing and more uh, validating. Uh, I think in, in all cases, you end up doing the discovery. You just they have to do the estimate before you do the discovery. <laughs> and, but you always do it. Thank you for the question. Any others? I think we're still good for five more minutes. Is that right? Oh, yeah, I think. I think we're, we're tight. Okay, yeah. well, um, I think, I think one, one thing before I let you guys go is I would say, what is the craziest project misestimation story? We have room for two. Anybody uh, want to share one? All right. Uh, I'm working on a project now. Uh, so you'll need to speak up for the uh, yeah. mic. Uh, I'm working on a project now for a, a whole website rebuild. And, you know, with, with university calendars, everyone tries to align stuff with the start of the semester. And uh, there was this thought that, oh, well, if you could just spend a lot of money right away, we can get it done really, really fast. Uh, and so we thought we were going to launch it. Or there was uh, a, a request to get it to be launched last fall. And now we're sprinting to actually still get it done for this fall. So it's not that crazy, but it's, it's, it's very much what I'm uh, grappling with. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's surprisingly very common in, in this world to, to be off by 100 or 300 percent, especially when it comes to calendar, if not actual hours, because of how the dependencies often work. Yeah. There's, a, there's a really great book that I read at the beginning of my career that I never forgot. It's called The Mythical Man Month. And uh, it, the, the title refers to the fact that you can't measure projects in man months because if you have like a brilliant, tight team that knows it, itself well and has worked together before and knows what they're doing, doubling or tripling, tripling the size of that team won't accelerate the project by a factor of two or three or four because he, he draws it like a matrix of communications and meetings and this that, that have to happen. And, and ultimately things get washed out because there's no single person who can keep the project in their head anymore because of how much is going on at once. And, and so that's, that's a really uh, great book that would probably explain some of what you're seeing. Uh, a lot of the concepts that we took here were from a book called Software Estimation by Steve McConnell. Uh, that's another highly recommended book I'd, I'd recommend you read. Okay, well, we're at, we're at time. Perfect, so I think we're good. So thank you very much for, for yes, your thank participation. You